Yeah, so I'm Brian, hello. Hi, Brian. Um, thank you for the cake earlier. <laughs> thank awesome. you. Yeah, I'm Sebastian, working with Brian again at VMware. Yeah, and... <laughs> and, and so, so many people have asked about um, my job at VMware, and if I like it, and what I'm doing, and all that kind of stuff. And so there's lots of time over years to discuss all that. But I've been traveling around a lot, sort of talking the story about why I joined VMware and what VMware is doing in the UC space. So I figured I'd start with that, and we can kind of do Q and A and chat and kind of talk about stuff. So sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, so yeah. So I'll give I'll give my spiel first, and then and then then we'll jump jump into questions. Okay. So here we go. Um, so okay. So my my background. So you know. I did BrianMed.com and the Brian Forum and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then two years ago, I tweeted that I was leaving the industry um, and leaving BrianMed.com. And maybe some of you saw this, you know, people asked what I was doing while I was gone, and this, uh, this camper van thing uh, bought this, uh, grew a beard, uh, and uh, which had a lot of white in it. Getting uh, Not creepy at all. Uh, but the best part, though, is here's my calendar. Like March yeah. of this year, this is my outlook calendar. So, so then, so then um, uh, April happens, and I tweeted this after some much needed rest and relaxation. I'm officially back at EUC full time, having just accepted a job at VMware, working in the EUC CTO's office with Sean Bass and team. He's uh, right over there. Uh, so, um, this is by the way, I joined VMware on April 1st. You notice the, the date of this announcement is April 2nd. <laughs> uh, if we're not able to um, announce that on April 1st and have anyone believe that I would join the vendor. <laughs> and um, by the way, so, so I showed you my March calendar, right? So this is April. So uh, here's May. Uh, red is travel. <laughs> um, and it's been crazy. In the first, actually it's seven months now of VMware, I've had 116 face-to-face -face customer meetings. Oh, that's not 494 speeches, there should be 49 speeches. Um, but the miles flown is correct, 225,000 miles flown uh, in like seven months, that's insane. <laughs> um, so but I've been talking to a lot of people, um, and so I figured, sorry, go to the meeting, it's popping up here. Um, so why I joined V, I, I, I wanna talk a little bit about how I ended up at VMware. Um, and frankly, it's this. I mean, it's, it's the people. It's, 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 it's this little kid here on the, on the side. This is <laughs> this is a Citrix CTP meeting uh, <laughs> from 2006. Rick Matt, there's me, Yeroon um, Rick Dellinger, Ron Olesby, Jeff Pish, Doug Brown, and um, Tiny Sean Bass. Uh, uh, now, I, I make fun, but I mean, look at me. Uh, yes, those are frosted tips. <laughs> Surfer dude. So yeah, that was uh, that was that was the time, um, and so it, it's interesting if you look at kind of why now, why the industry and all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, like the whole industry computing. I, I like to give a history to people because a lot of people who I talk to are still really focused on just mobility or just um, you know virtualization, just Windows or stuff like that. And so I think we have to take a step back um, and kind of look at the whole industry holistically. And so, um, but by the way, uh, if you if you want to sit, we talked about the. I'll give the first introduction, then we'll go both talking. So I don't want you to think that I'm ignoring uh, Sebastian here. <laughs> I mean, you can stand here if you want. But I'm just saying, like, so you all know uh, this is you know. Um, so uh, you know, in the beginning, there was nothing. Um, all IT, all computers, we had nothing. Uh, you know, then this thing happened. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, then we had, so you know, we, had, we had this thing, um, then there was uh, these guys for a while, uh, then humans came along at some point. Uh, eventually we organized the humans into offices, uh, a computer came along, and as soon as there was one computer, there became lots of computers. 
Uh, and, um, and, you know, we talked about having a strategy for managing, we didn't call it end user computing, but we have a strategy. What is the strategy? Um, I think in this day and age, our strategy for uh, computers was, was this, you know? We call, we call Dell, or we call uh, HP, and we just order a, a forklift pallet full of new machines every four years or so. And of course, these, there's things we, we do with them, right? Like, we image these machines as we uh, get them from the vendor. We deploy them to the users. Of course, we have to update the applications after a while they're on them. We have to patch the OS. We have to update the applications, patch the OS, update the applications, patch the OS, update the applications, patch the OS. Eventually, say, fuck it, we re image the thing. Uh, then we update uh, the applications, we patch the OS. Um, until eventually, we just retire it. Um, you know, we phone up Dell or HP, we get a new machine, we image it, we deploy it, um, and that's it. So, when you talk about end user computing strategy, for those younger people, we're talking about Novell earlier. Anyone who didn't know Novell or AOL or oh, I don't know, whatever it was. Netscape. That, and Netscape, that's what it was, yeah. Um, for all you who did not know Netscape, you're now caught up to 20 years <laughs> of enterprise desktop strategy. And it just goes around and around and around and around. And we say, you know, there's got to be a better way. Please, is there a way to make this better? Um, and Microsoft said, oh yeah, we can fix that. Bing. Here you go. Um, <laughs> so this is what is now System Center Configuration Manager, SCCM. It started as SMS in 1994. Anyone here not alive in 94? All right, that's, that's 24 years ago. This, this started. I saw one, I saw one. It's still older than you, my friend. Um, and here's the thing, you know, there's this saying about innovation, and if, you know, can you add, can you design new products via focus groups and, and things like that? You talk about people like in the U.S. We think Henry Ford invented the car because he's an American, um, and so you know when Henry Ford talk, you ask Henry Ford, oh, how'd you come up with the idea for the car? You didn't ask people what they wanted. And he said, of course, if I asked people what they wanted, they would say they want a faster horse that maybe doesn't get tired. They could not envision what a car was. And this is the same kind of world that we were living in in terms of end-use computing. Um, this is a faster horse, right? It's the same circle, it's the same processes, it's just automating everything. And so this was fine, but it didn't fundamentally change the game at all. For me, what fundamentally changed the game uh, was this. So remember Flying Angle Briefcase Man? Yeah, Metaframe. Yeah, Metaframe. metaframe. This is, uh, is Metaframe 1 to 8, I think. To me, when I first saw, I, I first got involved with Citrix in 97 with WinFrame, and it was not about remote access. It was not about security. It was not about Windows applications on Macs. It was purely about application delivery and application management. In my specific case, there was an Oracle application that was updated about twice a week. TNSnames.org, anyone? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Look at these hands! <laughs> and um, and this, is, this is how uh, I was updating all these machines. And we could put 15 users on one WinFrame box. So I only had to update one fifteenth as many users as often. That's what this was about. For me, it fundamentally changed the game of how applications were delivered. So this was the car versus the SMS was just the faster horse. Now, so to me, this was better than that. And of course, Citrix was doing their thing in the 90s, and that was fine, it progressed in the 2000s. And other companies came along over time. Um, there was this company, VMware. Uh, here's a 1999 website. Um, VMware strategy can be summarized with this slide. <laughs> um, yeah, they're caught up again. Um, oh, we got that. Yeah, okay. Remember the we, we, the, they were virtualizing phones, the phone OS, right? I mean, that's a thing. Um, and how'd that work out? You know, trying to virtualize everything. We we talk about over rotation. <laughs> um, you know, did not end well. And of course, there's a whole lot of people who loved this virtualizing of everything, and what it felt that would be the future. 
And I was blogging and writing a lot about this, and I didn't feel like I really got too much traction with that, so I wrote a book about it. I wrote a hardcover book about it, my only hardback I ever wrote. Um, that's why I wrote The Media Delusion. Which, by the way, if you look at the subtitle, it's why desktop virtualization failed to live up to the hype and what the future desktop will really look like. I did not believe the future was VDI. Um, and the reason, of course, is back then, the, the point I made, you know, when VDI first came in the world, you would look at what regular computers were. Every desktop in the world had quad cores or dual processor quad cores. You know, GPU 3D graphics and massive HD or two massive HD screens. You know, 3D surround sound, webcams, all sorts of crazy peripherals. <laughs> this is what desktop computing was. Now let's look at VDI. Man, a desktop is eight users per core, but VDI, we're talking about how many cores we can, how many users we can put on a core. It's not eight cores per user, it's one eighth of a core per user. Video? Yeah, we got video. We got a screen. Audio? Boop! <laughs> That's VDI. How is VDI so well, it's cheaper? Well, it fucking better be. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it cheaper? It's not the same product. I mean, it's like the user's desktop was a transformer and VDI was a GoBot. <laughs> Is it cheaper? Absolutely. Uh, those who grew up with GoBots, and by the way, if you don't have GoBots in Europe, you're caught up. <laughs> but I have GoBots. I also have the LA Gear Air shoes, not the Nike Airs or the Reeboks. Um, so VDI was tough, and I think a lot of the problems of VDI in the early days was caused by the fact that in order to make the cost dynamics work, you had to deliver a subpar product. Now, fortunately, this changed over time. And primarily, this changed because of this guy. This is Gordon Moore. You know him from Moore's Law. There's a lot of different ways to interpret Moore's Law, but basically, they all boil down to shit gets cheaper and faster over time. And that also applies to VDI. In fact, even a few short years after I wrote the VDI Delusion, I wrote a book called The New VDI Reality. Anyone heard of this? Like five people. <laughs> Everyone heard of the VDI delusion <laughs> uh, because it was like very menacing and big. But in the new VDI reality, I, I wrote about you know how the biggest barriers to VDI adoption have finally been solved. So I think that you know even a few short later, v, years later, VDI became pretty legitimate to where today it's, it's, it's a legit technology. So does that mean that now oh VDI is legit? So we're good to go. Like future. VDI and let's roll forward. And that's why I started looking at the past few years. You know, look, I, thankfully, you know, VMware kind of created VDI. Citrix sort of created popularized RDSH. It used to be VMware versus Citrix. Luckily, Citrix now does VDI. Uh, VMware now does RDSH. Both of them about remote delivering windows and applications and desktops from a data center. Um, that's great. So we can build these awesome VDI and RDSH environments, whether VMware or Citrix, you know, who cares? Um, and we feel good, and we high-five each other about how awesome it is, and we say, oh, let's go have some beers, which, by the way, I forgot that I can do that right now. <laughs> and as we go out to get the beers, I'm walking out to get the beer, passing all these desktops. And it's like, oh yeah, shit, there's all those physical desktops, too. Um, huh. So you build the best VDI in the world. You build the best RDSH in the world. Congratulations, you solved 12% of your users. <laughs> now, and by the way, the best VDI engineering, the best RDSH engineering, and you've got SANS and storage and protocols and all this kind of stuff, and the user logs on to this, the Windows desktop. You spend months building VDI, designing VDI, to create something that a user can walk down to the pharmacy and drop 200 euros on and have it done in 15 seconds. Because this isn't the corporate enterprise desktop. VDI is not your finish line, VDI is your starting line. You build VDI, you build RDSH just so you can have what a laptop can do for 200 euros in 12 minutes. 
How do you convert this to an enterprise desktop? Well, a few simple steps. <laughs> Just figure out these things. This is kind of a joke slide, but for real. Application installation, virtualization, image building, management, license, the GPUs, user profiles, and settings, app, better layering, user security, browser, remote troubleshooting, 32 desk, enterprise, printing files, network. All the shit we gotta do to convert the Windows desktop into an enterprise desktop. And by the way, that applies to all versions of Windows. Physical Windows desktops, VDI Windows desktops, RDSH Windows desktops. All that applies to Windows. Of course, none of that stuff that I'm mentioning has anything to do with the delivery mechanism of that, right? Because our VDI and our RDSH, that's still delivered via Citrix, Zen Desktop is delivered via VMware Horizon, something like that. But you're not using Zen, Zen Desktop Horizon for your physical, your physical or SCCM. Which I should change the slide, it's not just SCCM. SCCM is one leg of the three-legged stool, which also includes group policy and active directory. So we've got two different ways to deliver the same product depending on form factor. And we're thinking, okay, that's fine. I, I can deal with that. Um, this is manageable. Nobody change anything, we got this. So all is good until this asshole shows up <laughs> with this thing. Yeah. And users are all like, oh, emojis. Ooh, this is what users are thinking. Um, IT, oh, we can use emojis too. We have different emojis that we use. Uh, and then, of course, our users are like, oh yeah, I'm going to bring this thing to the office. And we have different emojis we can use. And then the users say, oh yeah, and you have to hook it up and make it work. And there's different emojis we can use. <laughs> so we're faced with this challenge of how do you take how do you take this? Or in those days we had, you know, Android, we had this thing, which I guess went to Android now, I'm throwing that. Um, so you know these things came along. And we said, well, we gotta figure out how to make these work in the corporate enterprise environment. Well, how do I do corporate enterprise environment now? What was that slide? I need my applications. I need it to be secure. I need to access it from anywhere. I need to have the shortcuts and integration, my data, my files, my content, understanding who I am, my antivirus, I need to protect it. I'm like, oh, we've actually already done all that stuff. And we can do it on this device too. You want all that on there? Bam, there you go. <laughs> Boom, problem solved. Oh, you want Android? Android, motherfucker, I got that. You want Windows? I can do that too. Citrix Synergy stood on stage. People from Citrix stood on Keynote of Synergy. People from VMware stood on stage at the, at the VM World Keynote showing this. And the audience fucking loved it. Of course, this does not solve a problem in the ways that the users wanted it to be solved. Because this is, it's, 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 it's unusable. You know, what we really need is we need an SMS for phones. You know, we need to take a phone and lock it down. Which, that technology exists, right? I can use technology on the phone. I can put MDM software on there. I can restrict what applications you install. I can not let you set the wallpaper. I can force you to authenticate to AD to unlock your phone. I can disable the camera. I can make it so you can't back anything up. I can lock down the applications. I can lock that phone down so tight to make completely compliant, deliver it to the users, which we do and we're excited about. The users take that. They accept it, they use it, and that works out well. Problem solved. Unfortunately, we forget that phones are small. So a user can have one phone from the corporate in one hand, and their other phone in their other hand. Which, by the way, this is why phones come in two colors. And so you can tell them apart, your work phone and your personal phone. So all of this, one of my favorite slides in all time is this one, it's a low res. This is a gate without a fence. <laughs> I guarantee you this is compliant. <laughs> what does Sean told say about the difference between compliance and security? Someone said, this road is important, thou shalt have a gate. We installed a gate, here's the thing, measure, the gate is this strong, all this kind of stuff. I guarantee someone came by to inspect that a month later and said, okay, is there a gate here? Yes, does it work? Yes. Badger here, yes? Okay. We are compliant, stamp, off we go. Um, we used to joke that compliance keeps you out of jail, but security keeps you out of the news. <laughs> compliance. Now, fortunately, 
you know, the mobile industry evolved over time. And, uh, you know, MDM evolved into MAM, which evolved into EMM, kind of, you know, uh, became pretty decent. We don't have time to go into all this stuff today, but uh, it, it worked out. Uh, and I look at our picture here. I've still got Windows Physical with SCCM and GPOs. I've got my virtual with Citrix or VMware. Um, you know, I've got iOS now. I've got Android now. Um, and these I'm going to manage with one of these EMM platforms is, you know, what was AirWatch at the time, then Mobile, Mobile Iron Man, 60 into, et cetera, et cetera. So but we're building more and more silos and more and more stacks, right? Now I've got three different products I'm working with, with three different managers and three different ways of doing things. And it's a, it starts to be a pain, but the problem, of course, people say, this is temporary, though. Because we know the future is this mobile and cloud thing, right? This is temporary because the future of Windows, man, ain't no future of Windows. The future of Windows is people saying, oh, you know, the keyboard is dead, or we're living in a post-PC world, or the desktop is dead. You know, all of these are really euphemisms for people saying that um, Windows is dead. Feel free to tweet this out, by the way. Uh, you know, and along with the caption, that one time Brian worked at VMware. Um, and this is, everyone was still Windows is dead. Look at the Windows market share. Look at Windows usage worldwide. It's dead. This is real data. Of course, there's a problem with this slide. Anyone? There's no scale. Yeah, there's no scale. There's no number. There's no scale. On axis. Let's add some scale here. Oh, <laughs> it's from 90 to 95 over four years. So this slide is true, but a highly misleading. If we unfuck this and make it human style, it looks more like that. <laughs> So Windows is dead, I guess, um, eventually. You know, we look at these articles from earlier this year. Smartphones are down, PCs are up, and yes, it's still 2018. In fact, my new boss, whom I love and respect very, very much, not you, Sean, um, wrote, since the post-PC era started, 3.6 billion PCs have been sold. Pretty good post-era. I don't know what products were saying. Now, post, post. PC errors. And one of my slides I've been using for 20 years, literally 20 years. You know, in this world, when whatever goes down, goes down, we're still going to have hostess Twinkies, because we always hear they're going to survive the nuclear apocalypse. <laughs> we're going to have cockroaches. And we're going to have machines running the Microsoft Windows operating system. Bing! <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, for all your zombie prep kits, that MCSC is looking pretty solid right now, isn't it? And now you know why those MVP things are unbreakable acrylic. <laughs> um, because if you look at if you look at Windows in the enterprise, you know the reality is if you have a lot of Windows apps, 100, 200, 500, whatever. Then let's say you have 400 Windows apps in your enterprise, and you can migrate, you know, one a month, which is crazy. Uh, it's still going to take you eh, this quick math, uh, 33 years. <laughs> and and this is by the way. Remember, one a month is crazy because Windows has been dead for 20 years, right? Right? Java is killing Windows. Genie is killing Windows. .NET is killing Windows. Web, AJS, Cloud, Mobile, Flex, Silverlight, SaaS, Mobile are killing Windows. Windows has been dead for 20 years. So guess what? All the easy apps have been migrated. If it was as simple as swapping an app out or rewriting a web front end for an app, uh, that's done already. Which means all the Windows apps you have today are the difficult ones. And there's a lot of Trojan secret Windows apps, like Office. People log Microsoft and hold up Microsoft did it right. They have Windows version of Office, iOS version, Android version, Mac version, web version of Office. Which one of those five versions of Office runs VBScript macros? <laughs> Just the Windows one. Uh, so that means how many of us have these these macros that tie into different databases and run your corporate reporting accounting system? That means that fucking Excel is a mandatory Windows application within your organization. And again, if it was easy to migrate off, it would have been done by now. So I do believe very strongly that this is not the future. Uh, the more accurate version of the future is actually this. Um, <laughs> we will be in that coffin uh, long before Windows will. Um, so, uh, that said, you know, this picture is going to exist for a while, and, and, you know, 
I won't go into details, but Mac OS is becoming a thing. You know, Chrome OS is becoming a thing. iOS is a thing. Android's a thing. We've got web and SaaS applications are a thing. You know, this, these are all things now. And how are we managing this? Citrix, Xanop, Zeta, VM Horizon for VDI and RDSH. We're using you know, AirWatts, Mobile, Intune, whatever, you know, uh, Mobile Iron for iOS and Android. We're using SCCM and GPOs for Windows Physical. We're using Jamf for Mac. We're using Google Chrome Enterprise Admin for Chrome OS. We're using God knows what to manage our web apps. <laughs> and all these are separate stacks with separate teams and separate licenses and separate consoles and separate features and capabilities and user experiences and admin experiences. So this is the landscape today. And uh, this is, this is the, 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 our reality, all of our reality. So what the vendors are doing is saying, wouldn't it be great uh, if uh, we could do something like just replace all these little products? Uh, I see what you did there. I see what I did there. <laughs> and I saw this. And I'm like, because um, you know, my story, as a quick aside, you know, earlier this year I decided I wanted to get a job because I like having money to live and eat. <laughs> and um, I was looking at like the cool companies. I thought, okay, I can go to like Amazon or Google or Microsoft. I thought maybe it's cool now. And, um, and so I thought I wanted to like work with a vendor and just kind of like fly around and talk to people about the future and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and I actually ran into Sean Bass at a conference uh, unexpectedly, before I joined anything, I was ready to go with a job for Amazon, and um, and I said, "Hey, I want to talk to you. I, I got news." He's like, "I got news too." And I'm like, "Oh, let's let's uh, get a drink." So we went out. We had um, I don't know, uh, what are those things? Tequilas? Uh, the ones from Mexico. Um, so I was talking about this, and I think Sean is independent. How do you like working at a big company? How do you like working at a vendor? I'm going to work at Amazon. All this kind of stuff. And so the next day he texts me, he's like, um, hey, great catching up, I gotta say, would you consider joining VMware? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I literally had this text conversation. Uh, we can go back and find it. Um, he's like, look, what we're doing now, like, like, if you go to Amazon, you'll be good there, you'll do good stuff, it'll be great, success, no problem. But like, what you've been talking about and railing about for a long time, what we're building right now, you should check it out. So obviously, I'm going to check it out at the moment for a long time. Um, because I'm going into this, so I'm looking at Workspace ONE, and I see, um, hello. Uh, and so I see, uh, you know, you hear about these things, and I'm like, um, a lot of vendors are talking about these giant platforms that do everything. It's like a suite, right? Uh, everyone turn around, I've seen a lot of Benny Trish, he's just watching the room. Uh, hello, baby. One, two, three. Hello, hello baby. Hey. 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 Yeah. All right. Now focus on Brian. Uh, <laughs> so. Benny's got a beard. <laughs> I thought so. I thought I'd be homeless, Benny. I thought I'd be like Jim. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, a lot of vendors for a long time have been have been saying that they have one suite to do everything. Citrix has been Citrix had the access suite in 2003. 15 years ago. Since it's access suites. And I said, well, yeah, we support everything. Um, well, how do you support Mac? Well, we have um, you know, the Citrix ICA client for Mac, the Citrix Password Manager for Mac, we have SSL VPN for Mac, we have you know, um, all these things for Mac. I'm like, yeah, but you're not like managing the Mac, you're just using the Mac to access Windows applications on, the, on your Zap, your veteran service. And simply Windows and everything. So a lot of these suites, have been similar slides, but they're not replacing all the things that are there. They are, um, they're adding to it. Uh, they're, they're adding uh, the ability to, to access Windows applications, but adding to what you have to do with SCCM and Jam and all that kind of stuff. Um, so VMware says, oh, we got Workspace ONE, it's everything. I'm like, ah, I'm not impressed. Um, I've seen this game before, like, not interested. Uh, and I said, no, like, this is it's good stuff. And I, I looked at it and I said, look, you know, VMware says, okay, well, you know, we can do VDI, RDSH, I believe that. You know, VMware Horizon, been around for a long time, making lots of improvements, quarterly releases, fine, that's legit. VMware could do iOS and Android and Chrome via what was AirWatch, now Workspace ONE Unified Endpoint Management. 
Uh, again, been a lot around a long time. I believe that no problem. Uh, VMware could do web applications, the Identity Manager, and the SAML integration, Kerberos gateways, and all that. So again, yes, they can do that. Um, but dude, come on. Physical Windows, <laughs> seriously. Physical Macs, seriously. Uh, and they're like, no, no, no. We can do physical uh, Windows because we can use modern management. You know, Windows 10 has a modern management API, and um, that's how we can do it. We don't have to use a traditional domain-based, you know, VPN and GPO. But we can do all the modern management. And I'm like, ah, uh, just a conversation over. Uh, there's a lot of limitations with modern management. Um, I mean, modern management, you know, uh, you can't do like regular Win32 applications, for example. Uh, you for modern management, you can only control specific settings that are exposed via the modern management API. You can't set any register key you want. Um, so to me, modern management has always had a lot of a lot of holes in it. And um, and VMware says no. Like, remember, modern management came out in Windows 8, right? Windows 8 came out in 2009. Uh, that's nine years old. So um, so modern management, like everything Microsoft, first version of modern management. Is, um, is, is Windows 8. Second version of modern management is Windows 8.1. Third version of modern management is Windows uh, 10. So it's Microsoft's third attempt at modern management is getting to be somewhat useful now. The more important thing is, you know, VMware has been working with modern management APIs for nine years as well. So VMware says, no, we don't sit there and just do everything that the APIs do. We have engineers and developers working out, and we we written extensions for that. You know, um, with our approach to modern management, the same agent that goes on there and has modern management on Windows, we can deploy any Windows application, even a Win32 zip file, you know, PowerShell script, batch file, whatever it is. Uh, we can deploy any register key and set any register key, even on machines that are not domain joined. Um, so we've been working on this also. The capabilities that Microsoft has for modern management uh, is not our capabilities, it's built on top of that. I'm like, man, SCCM though, there's a lot of complexity there. You're telling me that if you were going to deploy software, now you have like packages and installation options and command line scripts, and I have to look at package prerequisites and disk space and error code, conditional logic branching. And they're like, yeah, we have all that stuff. That's, that's all right here. I'm like, yeah. Ah, man, that's pretty good. <laughs> and uh, so, so you dig into it, it's like, oh, no, it actually like, passes the straight face test of like, no, we really can manage Windows 10 machines, not domain join with users with admin rights. I mean, modern management is crazy. A lot of people understand like this whole autopilot thing where you can take a device ID and roll it with Microsoft. There's a whole concept called the out of box experience. You know, autopilot is great for machines that corporation owns. But you know, the corporation doesn't have to own that machine for users to self-enroll in modern management. True story. Started VMware. I got my trusty Mac. Uh, it's old. There's a, the feature breaking off of that. She says, why don't you get a new Mac? Sean's here asking for it. I'm like, I don't need a new Mac. It works fine. Um, and, but when I joined VMware, I'm like, okay, I probably should have like a Chromebook and a Windows machine also, um, just to understand how everything works. But I'm not using a fucking Dell because, ugh. Um, probably make trouble for that one. Um, they're fine. I, I have a choice uh, of machine. <laughs> so I buy Samsung on uh, Amazon. It's made of metal. Um, it's nice. Uh, and so I order. I'm, I don't try to expect that. I buy it. I order. I get it to my apartment. I turn the machine on. Windows 10 Cortana. Hello. Um, you know, license agreement. Yes. You know, what is your email address? Be met at VMware.com. Ha, ha, ha. I'm a VMware employee for two days now. Um, next. Uh, workspace will log in the screen as you find our state factor authentication. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> like, back up with me. I bought a Samsung from Amazon with my own money. I'm in my apartment. This machine has been powered on for 14 seconds. And it's giving a workspace one log on screen asking uh, me to enter my password. What in the world is going on? So I'm like, um, game, I do the RSA, RSA, game, game, game. Next screen pops up, how do you open the machine to be managed? Let my organization manage it or I'll manage it myself. I'm like, um, let my organization manage it. Um, next screen, next screen, next screen, done. 
45 minute progress bar, office is installed, our VPN client is installed, we're saying one agent is installed, uh, license is flipped from, enterprise, from uh, pro to enterprise, secure on cloud setup, rebooted, boom. It's fully managed machine by my corporation that they did not know existed an hour earlier. It's phenomenal. And now I had to do some digging. It turns out that I was in the right group with an Active Directory. That's the out-of-box experience, uh, which has now been um, deployed more fully. But at the time, we were just piloting that internally. I just happened to be in the right group in a I guess because in the CTO office or something, where I had the permissions to self roll machines. Now, this machine is not domain joined, but I go to my computer, right-click, look at properties, and I see that it's managed. Um, I can do conditional access. I can get software. I can get everything I need on it. I'm an administrator. We have it for Mac too. Yeah. We have it for Mac. Yeah, I'm not going to Mac. I, I, I got that experience. I, I, I'm good. Thank you. Um, but it's um, but I mean, it, 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 you know, I said do, domain joins. The, the things today are are are, are different now than, than they were. Uh, we don't need domains um, to make uh, you know end user end user devices secure, right? Uh, Users kind of admin rights. In my case. I'm an admin, I could unroll my machine at any time, but then all the stuff is on, it disappears if the corporation put it on. And if the machine, if the corporation owns the device, wants to lock it in themselves, um, then that's when you autopilot, take the device that he's locked in. So anyway, I'm running out of time here, but the, the, the point is with all this is um, I was impressed. So I'm looking at all stuff and I'm like, okay, this is awesome, I'm on board, I like this, I like where we're going, I want to be part of this. Um, and of course, now my colleagues at VMware say, oh, um, we haven't even showed you the good stuff yet. <laughs> this is just what we're doing today. And I'm like, oh, I'm interested. Um, so, you know, Workspace ONE on the back end, uh, you know, it's tying into all the security and identity, you know, SSO multi-factor, you know, provisioning and access, configuration, personalization, data, the files, all that kind of stuff. Um, to me, the real value, and I'll have to go through this kind of quickly, is um, Workspace ONE has Identity Manager, which is doing all the identity federation, uh, uh, you know, connecting into your um, identity provider, whether that's uh, AD or Azure Active Directory or uh, Octo or whatever that's going to be. Um, the real value to me, though, where things get very interesting is looking at it as intelligence. Because what's happened is all of these products, all the platforms, everything, we're taking everything and rolling it up into the intelligence data lake. We're not collecting anything that hasn't been collected already. You're already collecting all stuff with SCCM in databases and log files. You're collecting with GM, you're collecting with mobile iron, you're collecting with Citrix. It's just we're putting it all in one place. So the stuff from the end user devices goes in there, um, the stuff from the identity manager goes in there. Um, and the idea with intelligence, it gives you everything you would assume anyway, dashboards, reports, your notifications, actions, uh, all this kind of stuff. But the real value to you with intelligence is uh, there's APIs and SDK, which allows us to do things like something we've announced is in beta, not shipping yet, uh, Trust Network, for example. So uh, Trust Network takes a bunch of companies. These are all companies who have uh, signed on so far um, and, and allows our customers, your customers, who are using Workspace ONE and using these companies, uh, allows these products to access the intelligence data lake directly uh, where maybe before there was agents on machines were collecting information and sending it up to some cloud service. It's the same stuff that we're already collecting anyway. Uh, so we're able to look at uh, you know, what's happening with the users, the environment, the states, the devices, uh, whitelist, blacklist, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, um, and, and these third parties to cloud services can run these analysis directly. Uh, and it's a tweet street. So if you're connected to some semantic global malware protection service and it notices a device opens up a new geo, uh, and it needs to push out a policy to block a certain Wi-Fi um, uh, virus something, then it could push down that configuration. Um, they also, in addition to being able to pull out intelligence, they can write into intelligence. So uh, a scenario of maybe you've got one of these products that's doing user scoring, you know, user behavior analytics, and it's looking at how the users behave and what their actions are. They can write a user score, which you can then use for conditional access uh, for users to access whatever device they're on, whatever web apps they're on, um, uh, resources to try and access. And it's consistent across uh, all the devices. So this is not just something that only works on Office apps, on iOS, or only Windows apps, or um, et cetera. Um, so there's a lot more happening here, which I can't get into because I've talked too long. Um, I will say there's a lot of cool things we're talking about. Um, we were talking about VMworld. For example, uh, do you know the common vulnerabilities and exploits data feed? CVE. CVE. Google it. Uh, 
Uh, it's it's cpe.miter.org. Um, it's sort of a US government public private partnership. It's like an RSS data feed for vulnerabilities and exploits. You don't want to be scared about the world. Just look, look at that raw feed and start reading through it. Man, this is everything. This is not just Windows, it's Windows, iOS, Mac, Linux, Android, like your Tesla, your toaster, oven, your Samsung TV, all that stuff is in there. Uh, it's got vulnerabilities, the updates, everything. Uh, it's got everything there. Do we, we are now moving to where we can consume this within Workspace ONE Intelligence. So that Workspace ONE Intelligence, it knows your entire EUC estate. It knows what's installed, what's not installed, what's running behaviors, all that kind of stuff. Now it can be consumed automatically. So the next time WannaCry comes out, it's not, oh, um, your boss wakes you up and calls and says, hey, how, uh, how have you heard of this? You have to look at the resource. It's, it's, it, the CD integration is downloaded that it's already identified uh, which devices have their vulnerable and one click and then we're starting to build packages and deploying those uh, to patch them. Or you can even set, you know, there's automation built into intelligence, so you can set that if a CD data feed of critical or higher comes out, just build that package and that advertisement and make it go down automatically. Uh, so if you've never heard of it before, and then boom, half your device are patched. You don't have to. Then set it to the person in front who's like, uh, yeah, we get scared of automatic. But sure, there's a lot, there's a lot to do. The point is there's, there's a lot of options. Um, there are always users behind but who claim things that might work. Oh, there, there's a whole other conversation about when you start talking about large estates of users from all over the world. But my point is, these are the types of things that we're talking about doing. You know, everything we're doing at this low level down here, managing iOS, managing Windows, managing um, you know, your virtual desktops, your physical desktops, your applications of security, that's all table stakes in today's world. That's all very important to do. Uh, and it's very important to do that well, and it's very important that, that to provide the features that people need. Um, but the real value that we see moving forward is these things like intelligence, with that CPE as an example I'm talking about. Um, there's other examples that are similar to um, um, like configuration templates. So you, know, you specify here is what the desired state configuration should look like of my devices. And then it's telling you what devices do not match that. Are you raising your hand for a question? I thought you were saying I had two minutes left. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. I googled for CBE and I found CBE 2018 6779. We have a workspace for unified app for management that's remote use of platform satellite. Yeah, uh, we're in there a lot. Absolutely. Uh, you found a fix for it too, which lists the right answer. 100% true. Oh, we're in there since there's my I'm telling you, this is everything. Every vulnerability, uh, I shouldn't say it like that, probably not every, but you know, this is, this is everything. You search for VMware and you page after page after page of VMware in there. Absolutely true. Um, but most things into the database, you know, most of these things are disclosed once fixes are released as well. So as part of that, the link to, you know, the patch and the update uh, is part of the data feed as well. Um, so anyway, I was given the five minutes to go sign about four minutes and 45 seconds ago. So I'm going to stop talking now. This is the, the gist overview of sort of how I think we got here now and what, to me, this is what end user computing uh, is about in today's world. And so if I just go, uh, let's see, we might go meeting control on the way. Um, if I look at, I look at our, our, our big picture of you know, EUC today, we still have to be good at managing the devices and the users and the security and content, and that's all important. But what we're focused on is allowing users to use whatever devices they want, delivering native experience to those devices, but still having the security and access controls regardless of the device, regardless of where the user is, and providing consistent user experience across all those devices. Um, and what I saw that was what was VMware was doing, and that's where we're going. Um, that was awesome. There's a no-brainer to me. Uh, so I joined the company, I uh, now live on an airplane, uh, and so far so good. So I'll, we'll talk more over here, so I guess. Um, sorry, I just, uh, <laughs> oh. This one's good. Oh, you want to thank you at the end? I didn't give Sebastian much time. No <laughs> <laughs> speak fast as I'm Sean. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, that's what we're doing uh, in the EC space. I'm super pumped about it. Um, thank you for the opportunity to talk about it today. The end.